Welcome to Crappie Hippies at the Bench, an instructional video series on how to tie your own jigs, flies, and create your own fish catching baits. Brought to you by Glasswater Angling for a Better Outdoors, makers of lead free fishing tackle, inventors of Angle King, the Crappie Dueler, and home to hand tied jester jigs, Ring King Paddle Tail Grubs, lead free jig heads, and more. Check us out at glasswaterangling.com. And now here's Crappie Hippie at the bench. Let's start again. Hey everybody, Crappie Hippie here, your tree hugging redneck from Eastern Kansas. And today we're gonna set hackle jigs aside and we're gonna work on a hack. Now we'll come back to hackle jigs, but I just been dying to get this hack in, been dying to show you all this and spring is coming strong, it's already here down south it's coming strong here to Kansas and it won't be long till it shows up up north too so it's high time we learned this hack and it is what I'm going to show you today is how to make a tail spinner jig now this is not my idea this is uh, this hack is actually belongs to Jimmy Lee and his channel is called RAR Fishing R-A-W-R -R. he has it on YouTube he also has it on Instagram and I just love his Instagram feed because he's a wire bait crazy man just like me and he loves to put spinners on stuff. He loves to make Tokyo and Jika rigs. He likes to take bits of wire and, you know, add a dancer blade to this or a, a spinner blade to that or, or all kinds of different things that he does. He's a really clever fellow. And this is one of the first things that I learned off his channel that I really got into and really liked. First, let me talk about tail spinners and why I'm doing this now. Um, I know crappie time is coming up. Uh, down south, in Texas, they're catching the sand bass. Oklahoma, they call them sand bass too, I do believe. But up here in Kansas, we call them white bass. But whatever you call them, you call them fun, right? I mean, I would think that whites would be a lot higher on people's game fish list if they were more accessible. But they tend to be a big water fish, big rivers, big lakes, big reservoirs. And so only in the spring can you really have a fair chance of catching them from shore. Yeah, there's some windy days in the summer and stuff where they'll come up on the rocks and, you know, that can be hit and miss. But if you know your stuff, you might be able to catch them from shore on a windy summer day or even a windy winter day. But uh, by and large... What I live for is the white bass run in the spring because when they go up the rivers, they can be a ton of fun. And with the waters a little cloudy, a little murky, then having some sort of spinner blade on there is just fantastic. And while I do use spin bellies and road runners and things like that a lot, uh, sometimes I'll use a jig spin. Uh, and of course, you know, but when I'm battling, you know, of course I can use a plain jig, but I'm talking about battling some, some off color water here and I want a spinner of some kind. Well, a tail spin in a river is so classic it, it just works like a wonder okay so we're going to make this for the white bass fishing the crappie fishing and i'll tell you one more thing tail spins are killer for trout so whether it's the tank scrubbers the naturalized trout or the wild trout it doesn't matter when trout season's getting ready to open up in the north uh the the put and take trout seasons we have here in these places like kansas where they dump the trout in and you're supposed to catch them all out before the weather gets hot that starts in March around here. So there's a lot of people out there looking for good baits to fish for trout. And I'll tell you, a tailspin can't be beat. So let's do a tailspin. Now, here we go. We're going to start this like any other jig. And here's a little hack. I don't do it all the time, obviously. You haven't seen me do it in all my videos. But this is something you can do. The professor highly recommends doing this. He, he says, you know, he ties a lot of little bitty flies and stuff, and this is an absolute essential if you're tying small flies because you don't get to put very many wraps on each step. Now, us jig folks, we're, uh, we're pretty liberal with that. We've got a lot, of, a lot more room for wraps, but we use bigger thread and all that. First, let me get my specs on here. So what I'm going to do, I laid down a little Sally Hansen's, but whether you're using Sally or something from Loon uh, product, uh, Head Cement, or you're using the super glue. Some guys or some people like to use the super glue. The professor says throw a little glue down first. And that will keep. Sound like a guy going through puberty. That will keep. <laughs> That's going to keep your wraps from sliding. Because, you know, one of the most aggravating things when you don't keep your line tight or your line, your your hat, your chenille and your thread and everything tight is to get to the end of the jig and have the whole shoot and match roll over on you, which is just aggravating. And we don't need that. So you want an extra strength. Here's a quick hack for you. Uh, 
put a little glue down, then do your wraps, and that'll keep things rock solid right from the get-go down in the foundation of your jig. Now, what I have on here is a bismuth alloy 1 8 ounce on a number 2 hook. The number 2 on a 1 8 is my favorite size hook uh, because I like it the way it scales with the size jigs I want to use, which are about 2 inches long. Inch and, inch and change to 2 and change, right in there. Uh, glass water, we make an uh, 8 ounce head that goes all the way up to a one aught hook so people can use it on grubs and stuff. And, of course, you find folks down south in the Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, the Carolinas, Georgia. You know, I'm going to miss somebody. Please don't be angry. I just know that you guys got those big crappie that a two ounce <laughs> that a two aught hook is just perfect for. So, and and you want those real big jigs because you got those nice thread fin and those crappie are used to feeding on a big fat thread fin shad. Um, but for me, in my crappie fishing, uh, I like this this number two hook and. The head paint I put on here is a head paint I got from TJ's. Uh, it's called Disco Lime, which I love the name, Disco Lime. Anyway, it's just a sparkly green. And since I'm not going to put any kind of tail on here other than the spinner, I decided to flash and whoop up the body just to kind of make it the whole flashy, flashy unit, okay? So that's what I'm going for here. Now, here is the hack. Here is the fun part. What you're going to do is you're going to take a piece of braid, and we all have spools of braid or other kind of line that, you know, not all of it quite fit on our reel, but we ain't got enough for next time either. So I'm going to put uh, this braid here is a, uh, it's, it's spider wire. It's a 10-pound test braid. It has a 3-pound test diameter when compared to monofilament. And um, it's good enough because the, we're not going to be holding fish. It just has to hold a spinner. Now, if you don't have confidence in this, buy, get 20-pound, get 30-pound. Heck, get 40 pound. 40 pound braid's gonna only have, you know, the diameter of an 8 to 10 pound test uh, uh, mono. So it doesn't matter just so long as it's, you know, gonna go through the eyelet on your on your uh, swivel, uh, you have no problem. Now, the main thing to do is that I want extra. And since this is basically scrap material, what do I care? You know, this, this is about an inch long, a little bit longer maybe, inch and change. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cut up at least a three or four inch piece of this. And that way I've got plenty to work with. Okay, so I'm taking my, my little piece of braid. I take my, now this is a number 10, a number 10 crane swivel. And yes, you can use a barrel swivel. And yes, you can use a, a ball bearing swivel. And of course, you can use a roller swivel, which aren't as popular here in this country, but they're very popular elsewhere. But it doesn't really matter as long as you got a good one, a good one, not one that's rusted, one that's, you know, freed up and, and uh, I'm going to get that glue off of there. And uh, now all we got to do is we got it like this. We got it on the, the braid. Okay. And this is our spinner mount. And, you know, you can make a spinner mount out of anything. You could even use a fine piece of wire on this if you wanted. Um, but I, I tried making these like with a stiff spinner mount, with a stainless uh, MIG wire spinner mount. It, this is just so much easier. And, of course, the first ones I made before I saw Jimmy's video, I just tied this, the, the swivel to the hook. And that'll work, but it's kind of clumsy. It's kind of tricky. And this is just so much better and easier. So we're going to get that on there. We're going to lay that flat. We're going to lay that, that eye flat on right there where the hook starts to bend, your last possible flat spot. And then we're going to take a couple turns with this just to kind of keep it in place. And then we're going to come down here and we are going to bring that thread right up against that just like that and I could have put the swivel back just a touch more but you don't want to get into where it starts to curve because that'll that'll cause you problems you want the so you can see I'm just just that direction of the hook point so you got to kind of swing in and out you don't want that hook point just snagging the heck out of your thread because that'll weaken it as it comes around so you may have to kind of Swing out away from it, okay? But now look, I got it on there. I put about five turns, 
and I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna put a stopper hitch and it's on all right I'll pull that rascal right on out of there all right and what I'm gonna do with this excess is I'm just gonna wrap it around the hook shank wrap it around the hook shank and then and then I'm gonna get it up here and keep hold of it here get my thread back because my threads running off on me and I'm gonna bring the thread up to it and now that braid piece of line is so locked in there that it is not going to go anywhere that swivel is going to stay on there as long as that little loop of braid stays intact and we'll just take these little pieces and we all know how tough braid can be to cut I mean it, it, it's far easier to cut with a knife of all things or a razor or something than it is to to cut with scissors unless your scissors are super 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 sharp okay so there we go get excited so now we've got our mount we've got our mount made for our spinner blade and let's talk about spinner blades for a minute now I'm gonna put an article down in, well not a, I'm gonna put an article in the show notes about spinner blades different kinds rotation rates and all this kind of stuff rather than just sit here and talk about it for 15 minutes that's not gonna help anybody you read that article you'll learn everything you need to know about spinner blades I will tell you there are the three the Trinity of spinner blades the most commonly used ones are Colorado Indiana and Willow and uh, I like all of them on this it depends on what I'm gonna do and uh, for today we're going to use a Indiana blade because that is kind of my favorite for this um, there's a picture right here and you can see in the picture what I put that picture in that's a a size zero Indiana that's a size one Indiana in brass and that's a size one Indiana in nickel brass now the size zero and the number one are Lakeland brand the three big spinner makers are Lakeland Hagen's and Worth and they all kind of size their stuff a little different so then you're buying from lure parts or Barlow's or Jans or whoever and you buy a, a bag of 50 or 100 spinner blades um, and then you buy them from somewhere else uh, they may not match you know you're looking at a number one here and number one there they may not match because there's variance in the way the makers size them there's no standard sizing so that's kind of annoying and yet it gives you so many options but the main point here is that on an eighth ounce jig I wouldn't go bigger than a number one and what I like in a Colorado on this is actually a Lakeland zero uh, because it's a little bigger than a double zero or a worth zero uh, it's smaller than a Hagen's one and and so on um, but you will find a supplier that has the blades that you really like uh, don't get too hung up on stuff I don't want you not fishing I don't want you not tying because you couldn't find a blade just like mine or you couldn't find a blade exactly like what you have pictured in your head because a lot of times the fish really don't care mainly what we want is we just don't want to overpower this to where it is a spinner with a jig attached because it's supposed to be a jig with a spinner attached you get my logic there okay so we were doing a number 10 swivel and on an eighth ounce I like a number 10 swivel uh, don't go higher than a number seven and I really think a 12 is a bit too small but if that's all you got that's all you got right or if you want you know the blade up really close or you want to use a really small blade uh, you might want to go down and in the last after we're done talking before the exit uh, music starts I will have a chart in there because I tie these every weight from 1 64th up to 3 8 and I'll have a little chart in there to show you the size swivel and the size ring and the size blades that I would recommend the parameters that you kind of stay in when you're doing this but for today we are going to use this one because I don't know who made this but it's a little smaller than the Lakeland and it's a little bigger uh, than the Lakeland zero and it's a little smaller than a Lakeland one so I don't know if worth made this that would be my guess but I got it at a flea market there was a guy there with these little 10 packs of brass blades they're about oh he had about eight of them or eight ten of them I bought them all 
because uh, this is a great size blade, and I love using brass in ponds, uh, especially in cans. If you got any kind of place where there's some algae and stuff, or you're fishing where carp or shiners, gold shiners and stuff like that are a large part of the diet of the fish you're fishing for, get yourself some brass blades because uh, they're going to increase your strikes quite a bit. Uh, and it goes great with this sparkly, sparkly um, disco head, disco lime. So what we're going to do, we're going to just let the, like I said, we're just going to let the blade be the tail. Now I'm going to come back with another video showing how yeah, you can tie some tail, you know, underneath this. You can uh, tie some different materials in here and you can do this, some different types of bodies. So we'll do a video on tails, do a video on bodies. And you'll have all kinds of tail spin jigs that you can go to for not just crappie, white bass, and trout, but small mouth like these, large mouth like these. Uh, the little ones are killer on big bluegills. Uh, you can just get with this pattern. You're going to have some fun with it. Okay, so I'm going to do this really cool uh, chenille. It's a new age chenille, and this real sparkly kind tends to run a little small, even though that is a number two size. So all I'm telling you is I'm basically going to um, want to uh, run a double body onto this. And you can do all kinds of things with this. You can take and make a real, you know, cone-shaped body. Or you can, you know, you can, uh, so you can wrap like single and then, you know, actually triple wrap it or whatever as you get moving up in through here uh, to make the body more cone-shaped. Uh, whatever you need to be happy and, and confident in your fishing that's what it's all about. Make the body as big or as small or whatever shape. Use your creativity. Make it look like you think it ought to look. You know, you know, you'll take it to the pond or the stream or the lake and you'll either get affirmation from the fish or you won't. And then you'll either like it a whole bunch or you may not like it so much. It depends. But I guarantee that I go up to the creek here in the middle of April and throw this thing but there's going to be a white bass that's going to want to eat it. Oh, and somebody did get a hold of me about Crazy Angler. And yeah, right now they only have like five colors in the in the super cheap rayon. Uh, yellow being one of them. Uh, and I buy a lot of yellow, so I've been buying that. But hopefully they'll get more colors in the rayon. But even if you don't get the rayon and that incredible a dollar a card deal that they're running over there, uh, I still fall for it. it it's, uh, what do they call it, a loss leader? I'll come in there and buy a few, few cards of the yellow chenille. And, and and then there's some weird colors like beige and stuff. That, I don't know. Maybe I'll buy a card of that just, just out of curiosity. But even so, they're undercutting everybody on pretty much everything by a few pennies to a, a lot of pennies. And I their selection is great. I love this grasshopper. I... I call the I make a jig where I just do this and this and then some uh, chartreuse with some crystal flash. We call it disco grasshopper. It's an awful lot of fun. So we're gonna give these rascally white bass in this stained Kansas water. We're gonna give them something they can see. We're gonna give them something that's gonna flash at them and talk to them and and uh, tell them, hey, come on, you know you're up here to spawn, but you gotta be a little hungry. I don't know if they hit these things because they're real hungry or they're just on rear horned up or whatever, but they go after these uh, chartreuse jigs like nothing else, especially if the water's stained. Now, here in Kansas, you know, our creeks are all full of sunfish, and especially like green sunfish, so that might be another reason that they're real fond of this. But anyhow, I'm using it. I love it. I'm going to put in another order with Crazy Angler real soon because I'm already almost out of this. I've had a lot of people want this jig, and... Um, I love to tie with this, but then again, aren't we all just like kids when we get a new toy, we want to play with it a lot, you know, but unlike some toys where we play with when we were kids, we just play with them a little and then we lose, play with them a little bit, lose interest, you know, guitar ends up under the bed, whatever. I don't know, going to be a while before I give up on old grasshopper here, because grasshopper is, uh, oops, I got to back up, look at me, look where I left my thread, clear down here in the middle. What a dork. I get to talking to y'all, and I'm sitting here making Bush League mistakes here. I need to bring this thread all the way up here, where I'm going to tie it off. And then I need to get it up here close, so it doesn't get in my way. Now I go back through. Pulling down. Pulling down. You can see that bobbing down. I'm bending it down. I'm testing that vise for all it's worth. I'm going to get that last wrap in there. Yes, I am. And I'm going to draw that down tight. 
and I like to take one, now slide it down the back of that head, and I like to make this crisscross on my first one. And, uh, and I like to make sure I'm not, that I'm really coming down the back of that head, because when you slide it down the back of the head, that makes all the wraps end up right there at the neck where you want them. You, you hate to turn it over and find that you've, you know, you've slipped and looped, you know, a wrap that hits clear in here. I mean, it's not going to hurt nothing, really, but it does kind of hurt your pride, and it does kind of hurt the appearance of the jig, but it's not the end of the world. I will not have people beating them up, beating themselves up over small mistakes, because this is ultimately not going to matter to our crappie, to our trout, to our bass, to our white bass. Uh, not going to matter to those guys and gals. They're going to womp on this no matter what. Okay, so now, simple. Got it in, slide it over. Slide it over. There's four or five of those. And rock it back and forth. And you're going to feel that knot. You're going to feel your whip finish. Pull down in there. And I'm going to come over here. I'm going to do at least two or three. And see, I got some wraps that are kind of up. And now I do that. Oops, I broke it. And that's okay. And now I'm going to find my little toothpick back here. And I am going to go ahead... Because I want these jigs to be sturdy. I mean, when you get into whites, I don't know how many of y'all out there love to fish for the whites. Uh, but you know when you get into a creek, you got a pool and a riffle, and that the, the whites are in that pool, that riffle's dumping in there, and then there's another riffle on the other end, or however it's going on. And that pool is full of whites, and you can even see white bass swimming up through there. Okay? You know your jig's going to get some punishment. Right? You're going to catch 10, 20, 30 white bass just as fast as you can throw in there. Uh, it's it's one of the greatest thrills in fishing in my mind. Uh, and if you've never done it, well, get out and do it. Look up. If you live in where there's whites, and I know that ain't everybody, but that is a blessing of all of us in the Mississippi drainage, either side, the old Midwest or, or the new Midwest out here in Kansas. I don't care if you're in Ohio or if you're in Kansas. you got white bass. And the white bass go all the way up, up into the upper Midwest and even into Canada, they've got a ton. They've got a great white bass fishery in Lake Winnipeg. It's not producing the the trophies like it used to, but it was about 20 years ago. They discovered that white bass were fun and and good and fun to catch, and people were catching a lot of you know three and four pound whites because they had never been picked on before. But now that they've got a fishery going, we got sport fishers out after them. Where not quite as many of the big ones there used to be, but by golly, there are still their rivers run just thick with them when the spawn is on. And I've always dreamed of starting down in Texas or Arkansas or something and following the white bass run north, you know, fish in Texas, fish in Arkansas, fish in Oklahoma, then in Kansas, then in one of the Dakotas maybe, uh, then go up and fish the rivers at, at Winnipeg in uh, late June when their white bass get going. And when that, you know, talk about crazy dreams, right? Oh, well, that's what makes life fun. Okay, so let's finish this thing up. And what we want to do now is we're just going to throw the spinner on there. And I like, with my number 10, I like a number one fine. Once again, this is not a ring that is going to be holding a hook. So you don't have to worry about how strong it is. Because uh, it's not going to hold that four-pound white bass you're going to catch this spring. All right? It doesn't have to. And then I use Zuron. They come, you can see the name kind of on there. They come with the, the light blue handles. They've got the finest tooth on them of any of your, you get it through there, you get it through there sideways, and then you just start turning it, turn it, turn it, and then when it flips the right way, you know you've done it. But Zuron uh, we tried to get them on. We tried to cozy up to them on the Lure Love podcast when I still had that going on. Uh, they really need to advertise to fishers. This is they do all their all their advertising for people to make jewelry, stuff like that, uh, and in sewing, you know, to put uh, rings on zippers and such. Uh, they're really missing a market because I have yet to find on fishing pliers or anywhere else. I have yet to find any that have that nice long fine tooth, and I have literally opened, you know. 5,000 rings with these things, and this is the only pair I've ever had, and it's still going strong after X years of doing this, so if you want my recommendation on this, you're going to get Zuron. So we got the got the blade on the ring, and now, now we can just take, and we're going to put 
you know, it's easier for me to do this out of the vice if you want to know the God's truth. And I'm, you know, got it on there, you can see. And then I just keep turning it. Now I'm grabbing it and turn it and you hear it click. And now everything is good. You've got, you don't want to end up with a, a little wild child of a thread there. All right, you don't want to end up with the blade not all the way down in the ring. You don't want to end up with the ring not all the way closed. You know, it, it, it'll give you a little click when you're, you go through the split and then you end up with it back on everything unified into a single. But there you have it. Basic, simple, uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lure. I, I've already caught a couple bass on, on a grasshopper version of this, and I can't wait to go down and try it. Our weather's supposed to improve next week. And you better know I'm going to be out with my tailspin trying for bass. All righty. Thanks for watching. This is, oh, let me take these off. Here we go. Ah, all those 3X glasses when I take them off. It's like, wow. All right. <laughs> anyway, this is Crappie Hippie, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas, telling you get out and make yourself, or get in your, uh, get in your shop, get to your bench, make yourself some tailspins. Uh, get out there after those trout, get after the bass, get after the white bass, get after the crappie, get after everything and anything with them. We will come back and talk about ways to put a tail on it, ways to put a different style body on it in upcoming videos. But thanks for tuning in today. Crappie hippie or tree hugging redneck from eastern Kansas saying tight lines and valentines. Peace out. Thank uh you. -huh.